So for me, I like the physical. I like falling out of scaffoldings. I like wrecking a car. I like. I'm into that stuff. I, it, it's just funnier. <laughs> Welcome back to For All The Saints. Uh, we're here with Michael Birkeland today, one of my personal heroes to embarrass him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I would have introduced you before this in a pre-recorded thing, but uh, I wanted to get straight on into comedy. Like, uh, what was your route into comedy? Was it something you always had an interest in? Uh, maybe comedic acting. Like I, I, me, like so many people, when I was in high school, we would watch Saturday Night Live, and on Sunday at church, we'd quote everything: Phil Harmon, Chris Farley, all the Dana Carver, the greats. But I, I knew I was going to be in the movie industry, but I never thought of doing stand up or comedy specific. And a girl talked me into doing an open mic one night, which I, I mean, I made never once thought like, hey, I'd like to try it. And uh, so we went. I went. And I, I did stand up, and I have that was in ninety December ninety two. I've done stand up ever since. I mean, I've been on Jay Leno. I've done. I mean, I've gone as far as you go with with stand up comedy, which is great. Uh, and it's a very time consuming world. So when I started having kids, I thought I can't be on the road this much, just me personally. But so I I learned how to write jokes, and I didn't realize I had a knack with it, and. So I'm luckily I've been able to do both comedy film and stand up comedy. How do you, what is the process of like writing a joke? How do you write a joke? Is there a formula to it? Um, so I, I realized early on I was a storyteller. So yeah, people that like they just said I've done it, da 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 da. Hey, you know, I'm not that kind of guy. Um, and I don't I don't hit punchlines that quick. So I take people on a story, and then I learned how to write stories. So I, I I realized that I couldn't do like one liners. I mean, there's little jokes within a story, but I had so many life stories that are really funny that me and my brothers and my I just I kind of had to happen. So, and I I chose the stake with uh with with uh, clean comedy. I'm probably more clean on stage than I am off stage. That's a good joke. But anyway, I, I didn't I I always wanted to kind of keep it super clean on stage so anybody could bring their kids or whatever. So I just took all the stories of my life. And I started running, how do I tell this? And I realized the way I tell a story to you is the way I would tell a story to 300 people. I, it's very conversational and a person like feels like they're a part of it. Um, and I just kind of thought that was the kind of how it worked for me. I, I couldn't do the, what do you call a guy? <laughs> I just, I wasn't that guy. So I would, I'll do 20 jokes, but then a, a 10 minute story, uh, like funny little bits or whatever. So. I kind of learned how to add things into that story. So, for instance, when I go into the handicap stall and I'm looking for an empty stall, I'm looking through cracks and you make eye contact. And then, uh, you know, so you, you can add to all these different parts uh, of the story. <laughs> and, uh, and then little by little, you just keep adding and adding to make the story funnier because most of them, kind of, they could be embarrassing, but I tell them as, as, the, as if they weren't. And people, they'll, they'll always relate to a story, generally speaking, but... The, That's kind of how I totally relate with that uh, toilet stall, by the way, because whenever I go to America, I just do not understand why the gaps are so big and why it's so how well. Like, we're, we're very private in Britain. And so, you know, when you're on the bathroom, no one's going to see you. You have no risk of that. Uh, but when I go to America, you do, you do. Like, I feel so self-conscious when I'm in the bathroom in America. But there's... Uh, it's true. When you kind of crash, you can see the person's jeans, the belt buckle. You're like, too much, too much, too much, too much. Great. I could, I could have just seen your eyes. Yeah. That's how, it. How do you deal with the, uh, yeah. or perhaps how did you cultivate the confidence to go and do stand up? Because I honestly, th like, I, I quite enjoy public speaking and I'm okay at it. And, you know, my, someone else I work for always says, if you're doing public speaking and you can get four laughs in a 45 minute speech, you've done fantastically. Whereas the the bar for stand-up comedians is like, if you don't get four laughs in a minute, uh, then you oh, yeah. have a bad job. That that seems terrifying to me. Yeah, at first it is. That, like when you're doing like a joke, you're just hoping like that one thing works. When And what happens is they, the clubs will go like, okay, I want you to do five minutes. I want you to do 10 minutes. I want you to do 12. And unfortunately, you, you get that kind of that slower 
because you're like, okay, how do I get seven minutes that are funny? It's one thing to be funny for two minutes, but seven minutes and now 15. And, uh, and because people do, they want, they want to be laughing. They come to a club for a reason, but I'd say it was interesting. When did you learn your style of what it is? Cause you have people that are great at one liners. They do them the whole way through. Once you learn your style, uh, you know how to keep a person hooked onto you for a longer period of time before they have to laugh again. So if, if you want, what you kind of, and as a storyteller, you're like, I'll, I'll do this build up, and there could be like 40 seconds of, it's not humorous, but they know that you're going to be humorous. So they, they'll, they'll listen in, they'll, they'll stick with you, but, uh, making sure that you're constantly putting something in that is probably the, it's not scary. It's kind of funny. Cause we're not staged. There's so many lights. You really only see like the first two rows. So you don't feel it. It's not like a, oh, there's 300 people here. I see 20. In some clubs, you can see a little more. Uh, but for the most part, when you're up there the first time, you know, you don't see much. And, you know, there some of it is that someone doesn't laugh. You know, how do you deal with that? And I always tell people, take your closest friends. And I mean closest friends, not, not, not family. And put them in a the club. Have them sit with other people in the club. And... If you're funny, they'll laugh along with everybody else. But when you're not funny and no one's laughing, your friends all laugh either. And when your friends don't laugh, it clicks something in your brain. I go, okay, I, I need to up it. I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something different. And you're thinking that on the fly while you're on the stage. And I've never bombed a show. Uh, fortunately, I've, I mean, I've had you know ups and downs like anybody. But I've never gone up and like had a, a joke ever bombed. So I'm really fortunate that way. I think I just got a, a good comedic you know, a rhythm by myself in general, but you know, it's too much SNL for, uh, you know, most of my youth. So I think I understood timing, but yeah. So you, um, you move then into acting, which sort of makes sense because you, you tell this, you know, your method is more storytelling where if you're a one line, a merchant, that would be kind of a weird transition in, into acting, but, uh, how did you find acting? Is it we sort of know it as a a cutthroat industry, um, but how was that experience for you? Uh, you know, it's funny. I grew up on a cattle ranch most of my life in Tennessee, and uh, in fact, it was the it was the church's beef farm, one of the church's beef farms. So a lot of our cattle we sold to the church, and then they get ready for uh, you know families that are in need or whatever. So I uh, I remember sitting on a tractor. A lot of times, I think, gosh, I just went with uh, my dad goes to Iraqi. How they do that? Or I'd see these. I, I was young when these epic movies came out: Jaws, Rocky, uh, Star Wars, Indiana Jones. And so I'm seeing these. And we didn't go to movies a lot because we had to work a lot. But we go see the epic ones. I had to know. I didn't know how it worked. And I, the acting side kind of clicked because I, I think I. I don't even, I didn't even notice technical things about them that I didn't see now, but I thought, man, they're able to entertain, to entertain me. I thought that was just, it was awesome. So I, I went on a mission, came home, went to New York, realized that's not the place to go. I went to LA and when you're married, you start having children in your Los Angeles. You, you can, you can stay there. There's no offense to anybody that wants to say, I was like, I'm not raising my family here. There's no way. So I got to figure it out. So I looked at research in Utah was the third highest filmmaking state. So I came here specifically for film. So I went out and I didn't have any schooling or anything. I just went out and thank goodness stand-up comedy started before I did any acting because it taught me how to be in front of people because it's the same thing on a set, except if people are going to laugh, they don't, they laugh to themselves because they don't want to mess up the sound. So it, it kind of got me used to, uh, you know, um, doing do, doing a, a character or story in front of a person and so when it came to having a camera there it for me it transitioned pretty easily i didn't feel unconfident i mean you have to learn your light you have to learn you know uh, sounding ticks and whatever but um i just knew i had to know how to do it I, I just what i always want to do is make movies and uh and so i, I got into commercials and music videos and whatever and then out of nowhere a group of us kind of met each other and Kurt, John, Dave, me, and they're like, hey, we're going to do this movie. And the movie, actually, if I remember the name, it's uh, John Moyer wrote a, a movie called Redeeming L.A., which is a great script, whatever. 
Legends are going through whatever, getting it ready. He said, I have an idea. What if we tell my life story? Let's make a comedy. You know, like, and at this point, really, no one's made a comedy. I mean, what about Thad, which came out in 74 or something like that? It was the phone call. People didn't make comedies. You know, they didn't make comedy features that were LDS at all. Uh, and so he tells the story about his life, which is the story of the singles war. And we're like, this is great. And that's where that whole, the, the writer, it's, it's his life story. I, I had no idea great. of that. But yeah, obviously, people listening, I assume, will know you primarily from that sort of golden era of, oh, of yeah. Latter-day Satan comedy films. I mean, what was that time like when we had that string? But obviously, Kurt and Dave uh, hailed, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of Kurt, 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 Dave Hunter, yeah. Um, Dave was... It's kind of funny. I think Dave just wanted to do something funny. I think he wanted comedy no matter what because he's a really funny guy. And Kurt would do whatever drama or comedy. He's a he's a you know a, a director, so he likes to grow his hair along, wear a hat, and tell everybody what to do. But no, I'm just kidding. anyway, the, uh, he's he's one he's one of the greatest actor directors, which is not not as common. But um, so when when they kind of cash out the story because they kind of film school together, they talked to Dave and said, "Hey, what do you think of this idea?" He's like, this is great. And what's interesting is, in a Mormon comedy, we didn't realize um, certain aspects where you where you had the benefit of watching it after it came out, and people had watched it and told you, like, oh, this is awesome. But when we first put it out, no one was watching it. And I was still being distributed the movies as well. And so we had in this theater in Provo, and uh, I'm like, man, this is crazy. Why is no one watching this movie? But we had no idea. This before Facebook. But there was a sense of, oh, they're making fun of the church. Nothing about the trailer said we're making fun of the church. It's very cultural, but we're we're crossing a chasm that no one had ever crossed, which is to be funny for an hour and a half culturally. And so I don't know where this FHE group from BYU went. It could have been UVU. No, it was BYU. And they they left the theater right before, like two days before they're going to say, hey, you can't stay here any longer. They went back, emailed. And the next day, I'm pretty sure from the next day on for, I think, almost four months, every matinee and night show was sold out for four months. And then we got into other theaters, and it kind of opened up the scene, and people were like, hey, it's not anti at all. But what's funny is you, the post stuff that happened, we, we would go to these towns that go promote the movie, Arizona or whatever. And every once in a while, you have like an old woman. And I remember this old woman came up to me. She's probably 100,000 years old. And he kind of like tapped me in the mouth, and I was like, I was like, hey, we cool on this. She's like, how could you do that to the hymns? How dare you? <laughs> and we're like, you're aware that we had to get permission from the first president of the church to do these hymns this way. And they're like, what? I, yeah, they're copywriting. We just didn't make this up. They had to prove what we were doing. But it, it crossed this huge area where people, number one, you really didn't know how to laugh at themselves in the right way. You could with a group of friends and make a couple of jokes. But in a, in a big open area, and if you had to kind of overcome a lot of stuff, because the movie came out, and then the soundtrack came out, and a Desert book, and of all their sales of all time, the, the number one book was the B book from Gordon B. Hinckley, Singles Worth the movie, and Singles Worth the soundtrack, and you could tell they're like, uh, easy, we don't pass up profits books, buddy, okay. <laughs> we, we were going for passing someone's books and it just so happened that we it came at the right time and we just did a few back-to-back singles word arm home teachers church fall single second word latter-day night live uh we did like a string of these comedies but the way we wrote them we never it never went too far I mean, it wasn't like anti at all it really kind of poked fun to be honest with you, i didn't grow up in utah when I read Singles World the first time, there's a few jokes I didn't get. And I was married when I moved to Utah. And so they're like, you need to go to Singles World at the BYU and just just sit in one sack of meeting and go to the class. I'm like, all right. So I tell my wife, I'm going to take my ring off, whatever. So I go in and I'm like, oh my gosh. Wow. It really is like this good gravy. Like there's, the, yeah, super unique, cool, interesting, and the weirdest characters in these Singles Awards. And I'm like, my gosh, man, this is, this is spot on. So we kind of stuck with that where we're going to make fun of the cultural side of it only. 
we didn't, well, obviously didn't go after anything doctrinal or, or whatever, but what ended up happening is the people started coming out and making movies, which is great. But if uh, someone tried to do comedy and it bombed, they'd immediately be in our face. I didn't like that movie. Uh, we don't make all of them. Relax. <laughs> you thought me and these two guys made 70 movies in four years? Come on, man. So there, it, it kind of, people were, they didn't know how to do it. The comedy was the hard one because you ride that fine line. Well, we had Dave Hunter, the producer, who's the grandson of Howard W. Hunter. You have uh, Kurt Hell, who's the grandson of uh, Bruce and Nathan Hell, the Hell Theater. You, and they grew up around a few of the apostles. So there, there's this, they made sure that they were never going to go too far. And culturally, they grew up kind of in that environment. So they knew how to tell that joke the right way. And as, as an actor, you know, you just, you, you do what you're told to do. And you make it as funny as possible. And I was lucky because my, my, my character was that, you know, that Johnny Utah that wore the, the braided belt that folded in and they kind of let me kind of play with the character. And I try to make him as goofball as possible, tucked in t-shirts, the socks with the Birkin socks. I mean, everything you could possibly do because it was so common, especially then I was like, man, who came with this outfit? This is the worst. But people kind of me go, dude, that outfit was freaking amazing, man. <laughs> anyway. So we, we, we got lucky. We came at the right time and people responded to it. So we're able to make, you know, more of them. And, and then we just kind of had everyone. I think a lot of actors didn't want to do just LDS comedy and stuff. And I was totally opposite. I didn't care. I just, I just to entertain people. And when, it, when I saw how much effect it had on the youth and people in the church, I was like, wait, we can't ever stop doing these. We got to, we got to figure out. So we, we've got a couple that we're going to do. We're coming down the pike here uh, that we're working on right now that I think people will really respond to well and they'll like, but uh, these things, yeah, these, these things affected me. When I, when I watched Cypher and Snow as a kid, I mean, these are movies that people don't even know anymore. Dude, a kid comes off the school bus, falls in the snow dead, and the credit roll's still going. Opening credits are still, I'm like, bro, who does that? Who kills a kid before your credit rolls? Anyway, and it's this incredible story, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Fall call was awesome. I mean, that's, like Napoleon Dynamite is like ripped from that character, but which is great. It's awesome because people are going to see that anyway. But anyway, long story short, the um, we noticed that people really responded, but the amount of movies that were coming out, we had to like really be careful uh, because they were associating everything with everyone else. So if and there were some flops that came out, um, and for, for whatever reason, and uh, and. It affected everybody. So if two flopped, people didn't want to come watch the next movie. That force that didn't affect us because we had kind of stopped making for a little while and all of our movies were made profitable. But there's a lot of people that made them and they're great. So, you know, we had a different outlook where we tell people that want to invest, like, just tell for sure you can lose everything. As long as you're willing to lose everything, please invest in this movie. We didn't that didn't happen. But if they knew that in advance, I think Kern Dave really smart that way because what you're doing, what, we're, what you're putting out that is beneficial. It's great. So whether it makes fun or not, let it affect one person in a good way. Let it affect 10 people in a good way. You know what I mean? And uh, we're forcing that way. But there was a lot that came out and their budgets were really high. And so, you know, you just, you kind of look, we kind of learned how to do it the right way. And we got really lucky. So we always kind of took breaks. I had to go make, go to make real money. And uh, I was like making hundreds of dollars a year just wasn't enough. So I said, why don't we uh, do some part-time work? And uh, so, so anyway, we, uh, and this is how we, a few of us were getting back together. We're in, a, we're, we're doing, we're in the kind of the pre on a couple of them now. So we'll, we'll put out a couple more. Because I, I now, in my, my personal life, I, I want to present entertainment really for, really for the members of our church. I, they're starving for great entertainment. And, uh, and so I, I, I want to provide it because, we're fortunate we know how to write it, but we're in a good way. So, do you, do anyway. you think we have missed that sort of holding up a mirror to your own quirks and culture but since those films sort of stopped uh, being made? Uh, yeah, a little bit. And uh, it's kind of funny because my personality is not like most. Uh, return missionary active worthy members i may have had a scattered past or whatever but as a as a person now um if i'm in a gospel doctrine class at church 
and someone starts to go off the rails with their topic, I'm the first person. Well, hey, 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 hey easy. Yeah, just don't don't go there because number one, you don't know what you're talking about. Number two, there's nothing to do with the lesson. So, but I I don't mind interjecting. It doesn't bother me. That I'm not embarrassed. And if the person feels weird, I'll talk about your class. Like, hey, don't take it personally. Just it's not about what you're saying. It's about what the next ten people are going to say after. And there are people in this room that are super sensitive with their testimony currently post COVID. So let's let's keep it dialed, man. Let's just go back to love my neighbor. Let's just make that the focal point. Love God, love your neighbor. Make make your lesson based around that concept in your head, and and it works. But there, what I think there has been a, a lag, and what's happened during that lag is there's uh, people that have left the church. And there are more ex-Mormon comedians going out and trying to be funny, making fun of certain. But they don't realize that you you go too far. I, I'll give you a great example. Adam Sandler came to Utah a few years ago. And uh, he this is about maybe 15, 20 years ago. I can't remember. But anyway, he came to Utah. And uh, and I'm sitting next to people. Uh, I mean, it's pretty bad. He was on Saturday Night Live at the time. And he starts ripping on Joseph Smith. And it wasn't even like a buildup. And he was trying to be funny about it. And you see dudes in the audience. I'm not kidding. They're, they were just like this. Imagine this is a beer. They're like, okay, that's, no. And they get up and leave. They put their beer down and leave. And these are people that aren't active, but they, they, they forget this crap. This is garbage, guys. We're out of here. I mean, it was like the weirdest thing you've ever seen. And in you have a certain amount of people that will respond and laugh and charity laugh. But for the most part, they don't want to laugh when you go too far. So uh, in, in we take this gap and people are like, oh, I've left now. So I'm going to make fun of the church. And I can tell you, people don't like that. They don't like they don't like it at all. And, I, and it's ironic because I do clean comedy. I mean, you could bring your 12-year-old, your 10-year-old, it wouldn't matter. You could bring your 5-year-old uh, to like a show I do. And almost every time people go, Man, I had no idea that you were Mormon. I, how how did you not know that? And I must give up a persona where I'm uh, I'm more relaxed or more chill about something. But if I talk about the church, whatever, and we can make jokes to everybody, if you get into a serious conversation with me, I'm one of those people that are well read. I, in my in my spare time for fun, uh, I read the Nagamati. Uh, I, I read. Uh, I read anything I get my hands on this, uh, you know, the the Book of the Dead. It doesn't matter. It, it, all religious texts I read, uh, all apocrypha, I read anything I get my hands on. So if we want to have a serious discussion, we do that. But if not, you know, it's, it's funny. And when people go, I, well, the only thing I know is you guys can't drink coffee and, and drink Coke. And I'm like, wow, that's all you know? But that's the things they know we can't do. But if you talk to a person about a member of the church, they'll generally say like, I know they have a gold book, and, uh, but they're the nicest neighbors I've ever had in my life. They, they never have anything bad to say. But ironically, what makes me laugh is they're going, oh, you guys going to drink coffee and Coke. Like, you said that as though coffee and Coke have been deemed by the uh, any food administration anywhere in the world as being healthy. Uh, neither one of those things are good for your body. No no uh, food department has ever been like, yeah, this do some coffee, man. It's awesome for your gut. Uh, it, it's so it's kind of funny. They, they see like the vices that we're unable to do, but I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, when I was in uh, high school, I was a, excuse me, I was a junior. My brother was in high school when he was like star of the basketball team, whatever. And, uh, after this game they won, he was in the back and the majority of the team was black. Uh, and, and my brother Scott was really good basketball player. So being white on all black team, you really had to know how to play basketball. That's not a joke. I said, <laughs> it must be for real. And, uh, but it, after the game was over, they're in the locker room talking and like, yeah, we're just going to get some beers, man. And, and my brother, and they knew he's Mormon. He's like, yeah, man, let's do some beers. He's just kind of kidding with them. And like two of his friends are like, <laughs> no, Scott, you, you don't get to drink any beer. He's like, no, nah, I'm just kidding. He goes, I don't care if you're kidding. You're not getting any beer. You're not going to be like us. You're, you're, you're different. And we're going to keep you that way. And I was like, and he was just kidding. You leave this impression on a person that you can't even imagine. Like, oh, Marvin boy, you easy. You, I'll get you some milk and you shut up, okay? <laughs> and it was kind of funny, but 
So, you know, and, and I, and I want to bring that comedy back into it because, um, there is this lag and after COVID, I saw people taking things way overly serious, especially, I, I know you see this a lot. This it's funny to me, but how many people come out to me and go, Oh dude, you know what I read? Read something about Oliver Cowdery. I was like, uh, go on. Yeah. During quarantine, I just, you know, Oliver Cowdery, some weird stuff. Okay, so if I get this straight, you believed a 14-year-old child went to a grove of trees during his prayer, and his father and his son, Jesus Christ, came to the earth, and Oliver Cowdery's bothering you? Come on down. Come on, man, do better than that. I mean, you can just say you don't want to live. It. That's cool. It, you know, if you don't want to live, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to love Jesus and Joseph Smith and the Holy Ghost. And you just want to drink, drink and party a little bit. It's cool. You don't need to put those worlds together. It's all right. Just, it's cool. It's just life, you know? But I find that a lot of people, they they can't go down that path unless they have a disillusionment. And uh, they go, no, it has nothing to do with that, Michael. Nothing. Two weeks later, they're on their back porch just drinking more beers you've ever seen. A person who drinks beer. Like, you make enough for lost time? Jeez, all out. No one drinks liquid that fast in general. My head. Anyway, you know what I'm saying, but it's kind of funny. So what I found is that there's, there has to be more, there, there needs to be more comedy because I'm finding that you can go through sensitive topics and sensitive uh, subjects. And if you do it in a comedic way, in the right way, it is funny. And you, and you kind of like take a step back because if you think Martin Harris and Oliver Cadre and David Whitmer have a weird story, there was a man, you may have heard of this book, it's called the Old Testament. Anyway, there's a man who was swallowed by a whale. There was a man who was in a den of lions and an angel brought him food. I mean, that's they, 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 the coolest story. But there's so, so many, and, and you have a problem with a pioneer guy who has zero background in religion. So, hey man, I need you to help translate some place and then I'm gonna go raise some people from the dead and you know, heal some people. I'm sorry. I'm gonna put down my plow. What are we doing? Like, yeah. I mean, they, they didn't have like you know years of whatever, and uh, so you're looking at a bunch of hillbillies, dude, and you're giving them the priesthood to change the world, and uh, and so there is something funny about that. There's something serious about. It. There's something funny about it too, and it's it makes me laugh. Like people do hyper focused on oh you know you have to care with the pioneers, you know that Mar Willie Hangar, which you have to be sensitive. That's a horrible story. But there's also a great story, which is the 90% that left when they were supposed to leave. They had babies all the way. They probably skipped it, hopscotch out in the dirt. Who knows what they were doing? Breakdancing for the first time. Who knows what they were doing? But there's also blessing by following at the right time and going through a traumatic experience, but not having to deal with cold and death and hunger and et cetera, et cetera. And there, and there are two sides of that story every time. But I think people are afraid to tell the funnier side because they don't, don't want to be insensitive or whatever. And it's not about being insensitive. It's, hey, we do weird stuff, man. I mean, it's cool weird, but it's, you know what I mean? Like, you're, you're from England. I grew up in Tennessee. My parents are converts. Their families are from Europe. You, you have, And then we get thrown in deep south. We don't relate to a white family at all. Zero. And we're super athletic. And our perspective of being a member of the church during a really difficult time during the 70s. I remember being in uh, the conference meeting when in Elton Tanner read the proclamation that uh, President Kimball gave. That all, and my member, our organist was black, and he and my dad were really close friends. And they immediately got up and embraced each other. It was this amazing event. But what I realized that people, if, because it, they weren't around then, and, or they were in Nebraska, where there there's no black people in Nebraska. And if there are, that's a lie. Anyway, they were in a place where they didn't actually culturally understand anything going on from an outsider's perspective. And so here is this really sensitive topic, and yet it, it changed the world. And yet, the year previous, excuse me, two years previous, when I was in first grade, is when segregation ended. They have no idea. 
the people have no idea what's going on. Now, our school had already kind of segregated or desegregated, but they made a mandate. 1975, you have to segregate. You can no longer have segregation. You have to implement this Jewish school. We can't do this anymore. Um, as though the, as a member of the church, if you have any form of racism, you do not have a testimony of Jesus Christ. You do not have a testimony that in the Garden of Eden, the original parents that created this world, we all come from the same genetic bloodline, whether you like it or not. And it doesn't matter geographically where you live or whatever. That's that's why we're asked to love God and love our neighbor. Is it you can't actually hate and you can't actually break any commandment if you live those two. Because you would never bear false witness, you'd never steal, you'd never do anything. And so there's this great, it's awesome to say that out loud, you know, as a, it's the hardest thing to live. But I've, I've seen so much stuff in this life, and so I try to bring it to in a different light. N not overly funny, but in a way, like, people, they're not educated anymore. They don't really know how the world was. And so when you're talking about pioneer stories are funny, dude. We have that. Me and Kurt have this story. I'm, I can't even tell this to anyone of your viewers, but we have this this funny um, uh, pioneer story that his grandpa wrote, and they never performed it on stage. I'll give you. I'll give you a brief. It's called Brother Brigham. We're gonna make it into a movie. It's be fun. Pioneer. His name is Brigham Young, but he's not the Brigham Young. Well, no one knows, and he doesn't even know what that means. So people are like, yeah, I'll go with this. I'll go with him, and they get lost. And it's this hilarious pioneer story. They they end up in Utah finally, but. It's this funny story because there are comical things about the pioneer era. So we're gonna, yeah. you know, we're gonna pull it up. Maybe we're probably gonna throw in, you know, the you know, cane running next to the horse. And why not? Throw it in there. We're gonna throw it in there. You know, that's that's a nice little wives tale that people like to throw in there. But if we don't find a way to teach it in a way where people uh, respond to it in a in a positive way, when you get into those deeper or hard to understand, if you have a basic of what's going on. You can handle the uh, the heavier topics that go on during any era, but if you have no concept, if you're not reading the Book of Mormon every day, if you're not reading the scriptures, the Old New Testament, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Great Price, and everything else, if you're not reading those things, yeah, it may sound crazy. It, it, all of it may sound crazy. Um, but when you are, all of a sudden, everything makes perfect sense. And so you, so we try to bring it in, in a good way. So we're, we're going to do some, we're gonna do some good ones. You, you, you're gonna you're gonna get some good ones. I'm, I'm doing a whole project on Jay Golden Campbell. Don't even get me started. Get ready, dude. Well, when can we expect this stuff? Is, is there any? Yeah, yeah. You you should expect uh, some of this one in uh, by the fall of this year. Oh, so this is this is really like. Oh, it's, it's I'm already I'm already doing it. It's uh and it's it's good and it's and I think it's I think it's timing. Mean, I've, I've I've always felt an association with them, and I had this awesome spiritual experience of how. His great great grandchildren and I met each other. This is the most amazing thing, and I've held on to this concept of doing this story for the longest time. He, he started his mission in Chattanooga, where I'm from, and he came back as a mission president. So we kind of knew stories about Jay Golden from Episcopalians and from Protestants and Baptists. So it's kind of funny. Oh yeah, dude. They, he he's the, <laughs> he's the reason why people think uh, uh, Mormons are crazy in in all the right ways. So the whole concept of Mormons having horns. He made that up when a riot was coming after him and the missionaries, and he starts yelling back. He's like, "Ah, God, we are orange. We're Mormons." And ever since, and that's like, and people don't even know this where it came from. And so, it's, and people need to know their their job isn't to be like a uh, Elder, Elder Rigdorf. Elder Rigdorf needs to be like Elder Rigdorf. You need to be exactly who you are. Bring that to the table. Don't act like everybody else. Is okay. And so, and I'm that person. So I, I want to encourage people to. Uh, Step outside of the normal, and uh, you can use a different verse. You don't have to use the same missionary scripture that you use every time during your faith talks. There's other faith scriptures out there that aren't in Scripture Master. You know what I'm saying? Like every time someone gives a talk, and you're like, yeah, yeah, that's, I know this one by heart because I had to memorize it. You're like, does anybody have any other scriptures on saints? He's, he's, there's a million of them out there. And so, but it's, it happens. People conform, and it's easier. Well, I don't, it's, I don't want the easy. I want you to bring what you have. I'll, I'll, Take what I have because I'm going to throw it out there anyway. So, you know, I was I was thinking about the uh, personality or identity of this podcast, and uh, we we came up with the tagline uh, "Conversations to refresh your faith." Uh, 
basically just trying to form something around that that word refresh and i think it's so important to if you are too serious or too dogmatic about the things that you believe in it does become a bore and it it becomes something uh worse than it's supposed to be and what it actually is and so i think you know uh these conversations and and comedy taking a a light approach to it in the right way as you do you know there's a reason that the ones you were involved in were successful you know uh, but when you watch them it feels refreshed it feels rejuvenated it feels like new you you find and that's the same with everything right you know when <clears throat> when you reintroduce happiness and levity into a relationship as well it feels like new and <clears throat> and new and rejuvenated and stuff but uh I, I wanted to get your sort of rundown on a specific scene that is one of my favorites. Uh, <clears throat> and something that I admire about you is your physical comedy. You know, even your stand-up <laughs> is very physical. You know, it's we we love that over in Britain. You know, we hold oh, Mr. Yeah, Miller, yeah. Miss Steve and all of that. And so when I watch The Home Teachers, the scene that stands out to me I mean, there are so many physical scenes in there, but the bathroom scene. <laughs> and I, just, I wonder, could you take us through like how you, how you make something like that, and how yeah. you approach, you know, physical comedy? Yeah. Um, so this is, it's kind of funny. What was nice is all, all the guys knew that I did physical comedy, and uh, and so th they let me kind of play a little bit. Like I could try. It. Try the way you want to try it. And a lot of times I wanted to go like even bigger and wider and crazier, but we don't want to overdo it. Like it's warm as this. Give them you know, like teaspoons of sugar before we give them all the, all the, all the meat. But the, uh, so I, I would like to go a little heavier and whatever, but so they kind of let me play with it a little bit. So when we, when we decided to do this, this part, so it happens in different places. So we do the opening scene of this house and then Dave built this bathroom that looked like the bathroom in the other house. And so when I fall through, it's just this man-made bathroom inside his garage. So when I drop through, and then I come off a scaffolding on, and uh, and so when we kind of talked about like how we're going to do this, and we figured out how we're going to do it, and how we're going to drop through, uh, and I get a lot of comments uh, from people sometimes. They're going, "Oh man, you remind me of Chris Farley." Sometimes, like, well, let me tell you, all fat people move the same, baby. Uh, I mean. I gain a lot of weight for these movies, but when you start, when you start, like if I shake my head, like you're like, oh, that's not Chris Farley, but if I had another hundred pounds, you'd be like, hey, you remind me of John Candy. Like every fat comedian is the same thing. They're just like, you remind me that, that it just turns into, you remind me of that fat guy. Like, you don't even have a name anymore. Jeez, look, peace. Um, so the, uh, I, me personally, whenever uh, I think of anything, I kind of let my body talk. When I'm doing something, because I don't want to do just be, especially comedy. When you're, when you're doing stand-up, especially when you're a storyteller, you learn something about an audience. If an audience feels like they're part of something you're doing, so for instance, I'll tell a story and I'm like, you don't even believe this. So the next thing you know, this guy shows up. I'm acting like the story happened yesterday. I've told this joke 50 times. They don't know that, but if it looks like I'm involving them, getting in, and that's just a physical thing you do. And when you're on stage, you have to kind of overdo it because. 20 year olds back, they got to see your face. But in the, in the film, it leaves your face. And a lot of comedians, when it's on their face, it, their body isn't comedic. And my body's as comedic as my face is. So if I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I'll, I'll move around like, Whoa, whatever, and like, you know, there's, eh, eh, eh. like, I, I'll do whatever to get like the lines out because it's going to be a funny scene. So if you let me go a little farther, I'll go further with it. But if not, then I'll stay in the bounds. But I can't just like, ha, 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 ha. Like, that's, that's not funny. And so I, I kind of like taught myself my face and my body from when you do stage to film, because it's super subtle because the camera's on your face. I just let my body do most of the work. And I get the lines out. And, you know, you have intonation. You have the, you're, you know, the way you say things, whatever. There's timing. But your body has to be just as much timing. So for me. I like the physical. I like falling out of scaffoldings. I like wrecking a car. I like, I'm into that stuff. I, it, it, it's funnier because it's not. It's, this isn't Stephen Wright. 
You know, the comedian who's always like, uh, I went downtown and I, I, I'm not monotone. I, when I'm on, if I'm on stage, I'm generally falling, I'm tripping, I'm, I'm spinning on the chair. I mean, like, I'm all over the place. And uh, it's a camera nightmare because I'll go, I'll cover that whole stage the whole time. And I don't want people to see me. And I want people to it could be, it could be a part of that you know, experience. So I kind of let loose physically, kind of let my body do that. I just, I let the body kind of read its own dialogue with it. And especially with a guy like Jeff Burke, who is super subtle comedy in his face. So good. So good. So when I go even a little physical, it looks even funnier because he's kind of in the suit and it ties up. And that is funny because that's his character. That's what makes it funny. And if I don't have it loose enough and I'm moving around and I got some food on my neck, it then I then I'm trying to play his character and it doesn't work that way. So it uh, I just I've been I've been lucky that they kind of let me be physical because you know I've been on some commercials where they're like bring it down. Like really bring it down? This is ridiculous. It's not even thing funny if we bring it down. But I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. It's, I'll do whatever you want me to do. But so for me, that that's kind of how I did. I just, I tend to go physical every time. I just think of of that scene and the uh, the memorial uh, service scene with the <laughs> with the guy in the coffin. It's just, it's just <laughs> you know, it's so good. every uh, you know we have so many comedies that you watch and. Rather than laughing, you sort of let an exhaled nose breath out. You say, like, but with with the home teachers and with your physical comedy, it is belly laughter like laugh out loud? I. Oh my gosh! Thank you. The, I'm so glad you said this. My wife met me. At, I met her at a gas station, and she had she had just watched Home Teachers the night before. She comes to the gas station, she beelines it to me, and I was like. Uh, it's this hot chick come toward me. I'm like, maybe she's directions. Friday's directions. That's the she's come to me. And she's like, are you Michael B? And I was like, wait, how do you know my name? And she's like, I just watched your movie last night. And I was like 160. I just ran a marathon. I was like in wagged shape, whatever. And she's like, so weird you're here. And we've been chatting for like four hours by our car. Just talked about everything in life, whatever. But the, the home teacher is like, she's like, I never laughed harder. But she's from Brazil. She goes, me and my friends all from Brazil. We all watched this movie. We're dying laughing. And, but when you leave America, and I know because I was raised by European parents, and they love Mr. Bean, love Monty Python, Monty, physical comedy. Oh, dude. My dad was Buster Keaton and uh, Chaplin growing up. I mean, just, I think I naturally go physical just, I think, just by way of, of nature. Um, I mean, look at Bean. doesn't even say five words in some of those things, and it is the funniest stuff you've ever seen in your life. And it's so simple. It is this funny face, the way he moves around. And my kids watch Beating, laugh their heads off. And I noticed the physical comedy also. Children love physical comedy. I mean, adults love it too. But when you get physical and you're funny around a child, if you've ever taught primary and nursery and you're trying to give a lesson, you're not being physical. Good luck. Good luck, dude. And I'm talking about Noah's Ark. I'm standing on a chair. I'm bringing the animals in. And, you know, I, otherwise, you're not listening to your story. So I think it was like tend to go that way. But you just tell me if I do dramatic things as well because my body doesn't, it feels natural in a situation where if I'm talking about something dramatic or serious, my body relaxes to that mode as well. But I'm so glad you said that. That's a great compliment. I, anytime someone's even watched the movie and says thank you, I'm, I'm always so grateful because we, we're so blessed to do that. And how many members got to see that? I mean, I don't want to brag on them, but I got a Japanese falling. So I baptized this kid on my mission, Masaki Kamori. He's just good dude. Just good dude. He comes back up. I go off my mission. He becomes a roommate of mine uh, somewhat in at Rick's College. Rick's, what's up, y'all? BYU, Idaho. Whatever. Give it a name. Anyway, Rick's West Lab. We had football and wrestling. Anyway, so I, I, I he's like, I'm going to go on a mission. I was like, well... Don't do your mission call here. You're going to go to Japan. And he's like, no, I won't. Yeah, yeah, you will. He gets called to Japan. Anyway, when he came back, we started making all these movies, whatever. For some reason, he he did subtitles in Japanese for the home teachers. Not any other movie. Just that one. For a second, this Japanese following. I mean, konnichiwa, you know what I mean? I mean yeah, a little brat. But, uh, there are parts of, uh, you know, Tokyo I don't go to. But, 
on a serious note, I uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's just kind of funny, and you don't you don't realize that you have such a strong effect with people anywhere, so that you really liked it. Does it? I thank you. I really appreciate that. No, no, did you um, did you ever feel a pressure from being such a big part of that sort of age of films? Where I know today, for example, if if someone gets popular and they are a, a very talented songwriter, many times will assign automatically a moral reputation to that person and hold them up in incredibly high regard it, to the so, to the sense that we may be disappointed at the slightest bad news we hear about them. And, I, and I'm oh, interested, yeah. you know, going to church and being around members and being such a big part of that sort of uh, culture at the time. Did you feel a weight on your shoulders where people expected you to, you know, be this LDS star and an example, you know, living like the prophet? Yeah. It's, it's true. It's weird you say that because it's funny. But people immediately put us on this pedestal that we didn't ask for. Uh, I mean, they wouldn't know if uh, the main girl wasn't. She, even though she's from Brigham Young's lineage, she's not a member of the church. Um, you know, Will was pseudo active then, but he's not active, but you know, no, no, no anger towards the church, whatever. And there, there are people that were struggling. They're me. I was one of those people. And, uh, but they had an expectation that the, I'll tell you the person who got it worst. I was always known to be a little edgy. So I don't think, I don't, I don't know how this is, but it didn't really shock as many people that I was a little off. I never left the church i never and I, I meaning i never didn't have a testimony i would never go against the church et cetera. and you know and some of those people you know where they had to rationalize their whatever i wasn't that guy um but what i found was interesting is uh kirby took heat more than anyone which is weird because he was he, he's I, I mean he's an example to me to this day he's, he's such a great person he's he's as good as you could imagine him to be in real life of what you think he is, he is that good and more. He's just, he's a very good person. And he is in LA. He's making, trying to make ends meet. He gets this beer commercial. Whatever. You don't, you don't drink beer and beer commercials because it gets the law anyway. But he makes good money. He's able to, you know, pay his rent and take care of his children. Up here in Utah, when that came out, oh my gosh. There was a company, not to bag on people, dearelder.com, took him off the billboard. You can't be in beer commercials, and uh, and then people would come up to me out of the blue. I don't even know them. I'm going, do you tell what you think about Kirby Dillon beer commercials? Uh, I don't know, just awesome because they pay like fifty grand. The rest of us make like a thousand on a commercial, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, really glad for them. Uh, you know, I'm in my head, I've done that. And but what I found is they, it's like they wanted me to parlay that into a conversation of how can we put him down. And I tell you what I learned. And this happens to anybody that has uh, money or fame or any type of notoriety uh, for what in whatever field, it doesn't really matter. There is this, uh, there's a humanistic side that I think is even more exposed so more, much more on, on social networks, but it is okay, that's great and all. I'm really glad Mother Teresa did all that stuff, but tell me when she stole the candy bar. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they don't even care. You could have saved a million children, but, uh, you trip an old lady on the street and you're that guy that tripped an old lady in the street like how dare you and uh you know it and they want something wrong but none of us asks you to find that many right things about us because we're just making movies we're, we're, we're going through the same struggles as anyone else but we're trying to do something lighthearted, something fun to kind of you know keep keep things alive and uh and unfortunately they're they do they put you on a pedestal and it's and so i, I but me personally i would talk to them just like don't, you know, don't judge people. You, you have no idea. You don't even know where you, whenever you say, I can't believe if someone did that commercial. Now, it's not a thing if, you, if someone did a movie and it's nudity all over, you can have an opinion about that. That would, that would be crazy. But when it's doing something that's not really wrong, how do you expect a person to go from, I'm going to make some church films, I'm going to be in commercials, I want to be in a bigger platform so I can really make a difference, and Kirby's that guy. No matter what he does, he makes a difference. I don't know if you've seen his show on, on BYU TV, but phenomenal show. It, 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 the show works because of him. But 
you wouldn't even have known who he was had he turned down all those roles. He thought, maybe I should. He would have never gained that popularity to the point to where a person, hey, we can put Kirby on the show and our show's going to do awesome. Well, everyone's like that. You you uh, you uh get used to seeing a personality and you start accepting them more and more and more. And he, no, he never walked down the, the wrong road of Hollywood. He never went into the secret society or the red door, whatever you want to call it. He never fell into that. His children are on missions. He's a bishop. He's he's a good dude. His wife's amazing. They're just just he, he, you. We went to entertain people, and uh, and if the entertainment of people doing the right thing all the time in that way is not your goal, then maybe you're going to be a person that does whatever roles offer to you. I don't take every role. I, I there's certain things I will never do, uh, and it doesn't matter if it, if it goes against the 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 norm or what people are trying to make his new, the new politically correct. There are certain characters I'm never going to have my children watch and ask me questions. Dad, why did you do that? I, I'm never going to have that conversation with a child. Never. Or my wife. I'm not going to go to movies that make out with women. Ever. Ever. I'm just not doing it. I, I don't need to do that. Uh, it's a movie. We're supposed to be doing make-believe. If we're going to do everything that's happening in real life, then it's not make-believe anymore. Now you're just telling a story. And, uh, and at that point, and people can do whatever they want. I'm not judging people that want to do that as an actor. You choose whatever you like. But me, uh, I don't, I'm not going to go down that path. I just, and I think I kind of have a tendency to where I want to, I do want to do more religious style uh, because no, no one's doing an offset, especially in comedy. And, uh, and we need to keep laughing because the Lord is going to return. And you got to ask, we got to be laughing until he gets here. And uh, we can't just, you can't go into a cave and hide and use your food storage and pretend like the world isn't going to, you, you got to go share the gospel. You got to love your neighbor. You got to perform temple ordinances. You still have to go live your life. You still have to be happy. There's a scripture, my buddy Ross McGarvey. It's funny the way he said it. He's from Scotland. He was like, he was like, yeah, there's a scripture you might know. It's uh, men are, they, may, they might have. What's that three-letter word? Joy. Yeah, joy. And people forget to have joy. And uh, and we have to have joy to so the whole thing. We were never asked to not have joy. When is the Lord come to the earth and it not been one of the worst times the earth has been? That's why he comes. He shows up at the worst time. on because It's the world wicked. You don't have to fall into that. You do what you do and you make the best of it. So I'm, I'm glad that, you know, certain people... Uh, that I, I've been examples of it where they 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 stand their ground and uh, you know they're not going to go off the beaten path just to make a project and uh, and a beer commercial is not off the beaten path it's commercial relax relax and and he's never said he was uh, Elder Dorf either he used Dorf twice it must mean a lot to me anyway the uh, it, but it's funny because the, what I see is this happens too. In a much uh, broader level, or I'll get into discussions, and, and I talk to people who have left or, or trying to return, and 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 I, I, it's not a bragging thing. I pray to my Heavenly Father every day, put me with a person, help me find a person, because I know it's like to struggle. Not that way. When I was like to struggle through something, I just never delved into I'm going to give up faith and God and all that stuff. I, I kept that alive. And yeah, people, that I heard it too many times. I go, well, you know. I had this church leader. You know what they said to me? Or uh, I heard this apostle once did this. He watched a raid at our movie. Uh, okay, okay. And? And then what happened? But yeah, he watched a raid at our movie. Listen, I don't know. It's how it works for me. You have Heavenly Father. And you pray to Heavenly Father through his son, Jesus Christ. He responds to you, to your soul and your heart and your mind, through the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, a promise. There is no one underneath that group of people. No one. There isn't a ledger that gets scrolled down. Now, a prophet has a calling. A patriarch has a calling. A missionary has a calling. A, a, a war missionary has a calling. What well, doesn't matter? Apostle. Now, their calling is something more broad. I need the apostles to not be perfect. I need them to make mistakes. I need them because I, I can't, I'm not going to pedestal them. They don't want to be pedestal. I know they don't. Um, but, they need to be able to make mistakes because they're human beings. It shows that God loves them so much. I'm not going to force you to do anything. 
if if we don't do something till 1978, you will answer for why you didn't follow that call before 1978. But do the best you can on every single thing else and do something else and do something else and, and you get to the point where you have people that will go to the next level, go to the next level, go to the next level. And you see on an emotional level, these apostles are talking in a way. I, I grew up in the in the Bruce Armacanke era and uh, there was not as much emotionality as there is now. I watched Jeffrey R. R. Holland going from crazy fanatic to probably the most sensitive, most heartfelt speakers you could have. Speak for our church. So much love and so much forgiveness and grace. Uh, you know, and they're it, it, and every, everyone had their whatever, but they are still human beings. That is their calling. You do not pray to them, you pray for them. And if you think the prophet can't not make a mistake, he can't misunderstand something. If he was a robot only, then he's, he's no longer a human being and he's no longer the prophet either. What prophet had a, had a, had a straight, straight, over across the line, never mess up? Let me name a few. Adam, Moses, Abraham, already. We, we, they ever one of those that has some trials. I don't know if you guys have read the stories, but anyway, so I need them to be that way. But don't pedestal people. You go to your heavenly father and your heavenly father only. And through his son and through that spirit, you know exactly how to communicate and how to receive the communication back. And then it's okay when you make a mistake. And it's okay when they make a mistake. We're all trying to do better. And if we get out of that, that the stereotype of, of, most Christianity in reality is okay, but where's where's the wrong part? What do they do bad? They can't be that nice. Well, it happens when you're seventy. Your grandma, you're just my buddy Ben Lane. I was talking about this today. These grandmas are amazing grandmas. They're like, oh, they just had a you know, a bad ball in their body. Well, they didn't know them when they were twenty five years old. They know at thirty when they're struggling. When they were seventeen. Every grandma should be awesome on their 70. Thank goodness, of course, they're going to give a butterscotch candy and tell you to go sit on the TV with grandpa. Whatever, it doesn't matter. But if you had to deal with them when they were 30, you would think, eh, you know, maybe they weren't that person. But they're learning. Thank goodness they evolved to a, a, a great moment. But, you know, it, it's a pedestal that no one should ever put me on or anyone on. But understand that I, I want... I want to give a person a feeling. I want to give a person a, another reason, another response. Instead of going to the same place in your brain, that's ah, funny. I've never thought of that way. You ever notice when you're in like a class, someone reads a verse you've read a hundred times, but their intonation in it is a little different and where they pause is different. You're like, hey, the, uh, my goodness, the most unprofessional I've ever been in my life. Am I right, Bobby? There's no, there's no one here. Anyway, um, the, uh, <laughs> but what, what, what changed my life uh, I was working in the temple after I got off my mission and I was at the Idaho Falls Temple and I was going down there probably more than I should be going down there. There was this man that had worked in the temple. Amazing. It's so many things that you had learned from him about the different things that we do in the temple and his perspective of working in the temple for 50 years. He's worked the temple. He's worked the veil. 50 years. And what, he's, what he knows and what he thinks and what he has explored, I, it just opened my mind to so many things. And... um one day I leave. I've, I've never seen him outside of the temple. And I see him walking to his car. And he's this old maverick. It's an old, got a breakdown car. And he kind of had a, a worn jacket and an older tie. Not as white shirt as the one that's in the temple. And for a split moment, I was like... And I I, I almost judged this man. It, what, what, one of the most influential people in my life. And for a split second, I almost judged him. And all of a sudden, it came over like, what are you looking at? What, what, you, you, I put him on something like, well, if you're this smart, if you're this intellectual, if you're able to do this, you must be blessed temporally. How did my brain come up with that? I don't know, but I, I'll, I'll never measure or level a person again from that. I, I, I can't do it. It, it, even talking about it now, it breaks my heart. They even thought that. And I apologized to him. Of course, he was like, yeah, that's a problem. He's the most humble guy ever. But it, it, I remember that. And so I don't I do not do that to people. I, it, they don't need to do that to us either. Because if your podcast got 50 million views, they're going to put you on one. One that you didn't create. 
And there, there is no, because that's human nature. That's what we do on the, in the world. We try to become whatever, but in this realm, we're trying to help each other, man. Yeah, I, I see that with um, one of the podcasts I work on, Modern Wisdom, has skyrocketed. And, and you see that now when people start to uh, put the host on a pedestal and, and the struggle that that comes with. And But, I'm, but I mean, I, I was um, similarly privileged like I am today to record with uh, the actor James Fox uh, a couple months ago and He's someone as well who massively inspires me. And, you know, af after he found God, he had to make several of those decisions too. Of He was offered a role in The French Lieutenant's Wife um, after returning to Hollywood from his break in uh, where he wanted to focus on Christianity and discovering what he'd just learned about and sort of changing his life. And, uh, yeah, he... Um, he rejected that because there were many explicit scenes that he would have had to do and he wasn't prepared to go through that again. And, you know, if you were, if you were to judge him on what he had done in the past with, you know, he was in a performance with Mick Jagger, which was a very raunchy film uh, and was sort of known for being shocking at the time, then, uh, goodness, you know, he, uh, he would have struggled with that because, you know, we just, we can't judge. And, I think your viewpoint and vantage point uh, as someone who is so involved in comedy is so helpful and refreshing. And, you know, you you look as well today where there was a survey done recently that was kind of shocking in that young people were asked if uh, how they felt about explicit scenes in films and, and a lot of other things in media. And they came out to say that no we don't actually want any of these they're uncomfortable we don't we want escape of them we we want good stuff again and yeah that across the board things like that are happening and so i i feel that what you're doing now and what you're bringing and what you have brought is more relevant than ever before so you know i i thank you for that and thank you for your testimony and and the wisdom that you've shared and the unique insights that you bring Oh gosh, thank you so much. It's like there is no better compliment. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, uh, and you know, you've been modest too in the sense that we talked about um the pressure and stuff and you have an incredible story um of overcoming addiction throughout all of these times and you know I would encourage people to go and watch the other podcasts where you've been <laughs> admirably open about it because I'm I'm over my time here and you know we could spend hours talking about that but uh i do encourage people to go and listen to the many other podcasts that have covered that and yeah th thank you so much michael i mean where can people go to to keep up with what you're doing and for these exciting projects um i'm working on a website because i've never done it i'm that guy like i should have more stuff going on but at instagram and tiktok is probably where i'll post stuff the most I, I I'm not a glory hound, so I I should spend more time on these um uh, on these net on these places, but I'm going to start. But it's gonna be that same kind of vibe and feel. But I'll I'll kind of update when uh, some of these projects are coming out and 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 I let me give you a comment. I appreciate what you do because what you're doing is helping draw people back to the source and uh, the creator of all mankind of this entire universe. And people forget when the world starts to come at them. From every angle, whether it's from immorality or justification or rationalization of what a person should or shouldn't be, the world's view and what God's view is of who anyone is, they're completely opposite. And you are this amazing reminder that amongst all the darkness that's out there, there is so much light. And you share that light, which is, I, I love taking my hat off to you. Thank you. That's uh, That means a lot coming from you, especially so... Thank you for it. Not to hold you up on a pedestal. I know we've talked. <laughs> but the Red <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm just kidding. But yeah. thank you so much. And I uh, hope you have a great day. And thanks for coming on. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching For All The Saints. This show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts. 
subscribe to the channel and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.